Watch this. She was fired for saying the State Department of Education is a hostile place to work. That's according to a lawsuit she intends to file. He only passed through Boise once as a player, but Kobe Bryant certainly left an impression on those playing here now. And Baby Yoda, so cute I could eat you up. Literally. The term whistleblower has been used a lot lately, but a local woman says she was fired for being one. So says a former employee of the State Department of Education. A tort claim filed with the state tells the story of a boss out to get an employee because they reported working in a hostile work environment. The boss in this case, Idaho's highest ranking education official, Sherry Ybarra. Joe Paris walks us through the case. Her future at the State Department of Education seemed promising. Kelly Brady was handpicked by Superintendent of Public Instruction Sherry Ibarra to become the Director of Mastery in Education back in 2015. But in early 2019, Kelly Brady was fired. The question here is why? According to a tort claim filed by Brady, she believed that she was terminated for being a whistleblower. Her story picks up in March of 2019. During an investigation into a different HR incident, Brady was interviewed about what the environment at the State Department of Education was like. Brady said that she answered truthfully, saying in part that she did feel working at the State Department of Education was hostile under Ibarra. She added that some people were fearful of losing their jobs. Those answers she gave were included in a final report about the incident that ended up on Ibarra's desk. Brady alleges that's when Ibarra and the State Department of Education began retaliating against her. The tort claim details how Ibarra and other State Department employees began to simply ignore her for weeks after that, and effectively, she says, she was replaced by a newly hired co-director. Other claims in the tort include that while sitting alone, Ibarra put her head down and ignored Brady at a breakfast they were both at. The claim also details Ibarra's behavior towards Brady drastically changing from when she sent this text message in the summer of 2018. She said, quote, Nice work, you rock star, and happy birthday. Even more recently, in January 2019, Ibarra texted Brady after an event saying, quote, Nice job. You rocked it. So impressive. I was in the back again. Thank you for all you do. The tort claim argues that Ibarra's change in behavior was simply centered on what Brady said in her interview with HR when she blew the whistle. By July 2019, things started to unravel. The tort claim details Brady being pulled into a meeting where she was told about a complaint that had been filed against her, saying that she was creating a hostile work environment. On August 12, 2019, Brady was fired. Her termination letter said in part, quote, While the investigation has not concluded, this letter is to inform you that it is in the agency's best interest to terminate your employment from the State Department of Education. The tort adds that the employee who allegedly brought allegations against Ms. Brady no longer works for the State Department of Education. I reached out for comment on this tort claim from Superintendent Ibarra. A spokesman tells me, though, they cannot comment on pending litigation. I guess that's the key word here, pending litigation, not quite a lawsuit just yet. What happens next? Well, it's just a tort claim for now, Brian. So the state of Idaho has 90 days to respond, and there's a few options they have. If they wanted to, they could accept the claims and say, yep, we own up to it. We will settle out of court. We'll figure this out. Options two and three are essentially the same. They can straight out deny the claim, or they can really let it go without responding after the 90 days. And if they go that route, from that point, Ms. Brady would be able to actually sue in court, and then we would have a lawsuit. All right. Well, I guess we'll wait that 90 days and see what happens. All right. Thanks, Joe. What's the penalty for making racist and hateful cross country phone calls? The FCC says it's $13 million. That's how much a Sandpoint, Idaho man with neo-Nazi ties has been fined for using caller ID to spoof thousands of robocalls, a practice they call neighborhood spoofing, which is making calls look like they come from local numbers. You've likely seen your phone light up with a number from, say, Potlatch, and you don't know anyone in Potlatch. That's what that is. The FCC says Scott Rhodes targeted at least six specific communities attacking one of them, attacking a California senator's Jewish heritage, making racist claims about two gubernatorial candidates in Florida and Georgia, targeting the family of a murder victim in Iowa and promoting an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory in the Charleston, Virginia hate crime murder. Then in September of 2018, the Sandpoint Reader newspaper exposed Rhodes' identity, which then prompted him to robocall hundreds of Sandpoint residents. 
telling them to, quote, burn out the cancer. What to do with Expo Idaho? It's been a big topic of discussion since 2016 when Lebois Racing Park closed for good. The 247 acre lot still used for the occasional weekend trade show and the annual Western Idaho Fair in late August. Well, now it's up to a group of 16 people and the Ada County Commissioners to decide its fate. But why now? Well, Ada County Commissioner Kendra Kenyon, Kenyon told our partners, the Idaho Press, they had been thinking about it for some time, but the commission now has, quote, political will to make the changes. It's also a prime piece of real estate in the already red hot real estate market. Earlier this week, the Expo Idaho Advisory Committee met for the first time to learn what their role will be in the process and to toss around some ideas. One of those ideas, moving the fairgrounds altogether. Kenyon says no ideas are off the table. The group expected to meet for the next several months and no word on when a decision is expected to be made. Contrary to the we're full mindset, Treasure Valley's housing boom is expected to continue to climb. One economist says by not, it's going to jump about 9% this year alone. But it also comes at a price and one that Idahoans have been struggling with for years. It's called the cost of living. Our partners at the Idaho Press report that during a presentation, Windermere Real Estate's chief economist, Matthew Gardner, cautioned about the area reaching that tipping point. The one where the working class could potentially no longer afford to live within city limits. Some say we're already close. In just five years, from 2014 to 2019, the median sales price of a single family home in Boise jumped 75 percent. It went from about $173,000 to $303,000. There are some signs, though, of slowing down. Gardner says home prices will increase 3 percent this year, which is the lowest growth rate since 2012. Imagine getting this message on your next door app. Spotted, big kitty roaming the Woodside neighborhood. Not sure who it belongs to, but it's not exactly pleasant when approached. Well, it turns out that big kitty was a mountain lion just bounding about dangerously close to the Woodside subdivision in Haley. This video from Marina Vercelli, who happened to be inside her car. Fish and Game eventually did put the lion down for safety reasons. This is the 70th sighting of a mountain lion in that region since December 5th. So that's quite a lot over the last couple months. Of course, I was kidding about the next door notification, but seriously, if you ever do come across a mountain lion and you're not in your car, Fish and Game says you should stand your ground, make yourself appear larger, and make loud noises. And like you would with a toddler with a Sharpie, never turn your back on the lion. He was an icon for the millennial generation, including a whole lot of young men who now play for the Boise State Broncos. They share how Kobe Bryant helped shape their lives. And it's Friday. What's your good news? Send us your thoughts, your comments, questions about today's show. Text us that number on your screen, 321-5614. Make sure to include your name. Don't forget that area code 208. We're going to share some of your thoughts at the end of the show. Today we say goodbye to Scott Spencer. He passed away early this morning after a battle with colon cancer. Many of you know that Scott founded the Spirit of Boise Balloon Classic in 1991. Since then, he helped create lifelong memories for Idaho families. Scott was a kind and honest friend. He loved being in the sky, putting on a show, and traveling the world with his colorful balloons. Scott was awarded the key to the city of Boise last year. He was so surprised at the ceremony. And while his family surrounded him and he smiled, he turned and looked at me and said he couldn't be happier. And thank everybody that's ever looked up in the sky and said, it's a balloon. And no, it's Scott Spencer. <laughs>
Thank you, Kobe. Thank you, Kobe. I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't even have picked up a basketball in the first place. This has been absolutely beautiful, you guys. I can't believe it's come to an end. I want to thank you for really inspiring the next generation of athletes. You have done so much for this game. I'm so thankful for everything you've done for the game of basketball, just the drive and the passion you played with. Um, I love you so much, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss you. What can I say? Mamba out. Thank you, Kobe, for your mentality, for your competitive spirit, and your love of the game and love of people. You will be remembered for the rest of life, man. We miss you. We hope you rest in peace. And you know, we're gonna continue your legacy, man. We got you. I love you, man. Thank you again. Sports Director Jay Tuss joining us now. You were down there at Boise State talking to these guys about that. What was the mood this week, and especially um, earlier this week? Man, there's some heavy hearts down there at Boise State, and the guys are going to kind of uh, great extents to do whatever they can to honor him. I mean, they can't wear a Kobe Bryant jersey on the court, but you'll notice a lot of them are riding on their shoes, and get this, Brian. Is that allowed by NCAA rules? It is, yes. Okay. Uh, and get, get this, though, about half of the team now has switched uh, from whatever they were traditionally wearing to huh. wearing Kobe Bryant shoes. Justinian Jessup even went out to the mall, bought a pair of Kobe's just so he would have them uh, when, he, when they suited up and they, they took on San Jose State on Wednesday. And he scored 21 points, by the way. That's amazing. Well, as expected, you know, there's a lot of connections to basketball because they're basketball players. But yeah. I had no idea there was a lot of Kobe Bryant connections around the Treasure Valley and around Idaho outside of basketball. Right. I, I think you see just... Um, the effect that he had on everybody. Now, Kobe Bryant has been to Boise. It was for a very brief time in 1996, but man, did he leave uh, a footprint that really lasted and impacted our local basketball scene. Uh, but you're right, even common people. You know, I, I ran into a couple pretty big shoe collectors, yeah. and uh, Kobe Bryant shoes are, are very, very popular. And so uh, one guy has up to 60 pairs of Kobe Bryant shoes. Another guy had about 30 pairs, and I say had because about a year ago, he sold them. And if you wonder about the value of these things, they help him put a down payment on his house. Wow. Uh, you'll notice other things around the city, though. You'll see, you'll see a number of billboards with Kobe mm -hmm. Bryant's name on them. Um, downtown, uh, you'll see a couple of the buildings that are lit up in purple and gold, and they will remain that way through the memorial service of Kobe Bryant. So, and you're going to tell these stories coming up on Sunday. Yeah, we'll have a chance on Sunday Sports Extra to, to dive into a lot of these stories. There's even a basketball player out at, the, uh, out at Northwest Nazarene. He's named Kobe. That's not just a coincidence. His dad was a big mm -hmm. Kobe fan, and so he named his young son Kobe. Kobe, and he's a basketball player and a heck of a basketball player, too. All right, we'll check it out mm -hmm. coming up on Sunday Sports Extra. Thanks, Jay. Yep. Well, got to let you know that we do have the sunshine outside, and it's, it's going to make a difference. If you're going to be outside for tonight, temperatures will be at least in the 40s even, up until about 9 or 10 o'clock this evening, so it's looking pretty good. Now, just to show you that this month, as we end this month, that's why I decided to take this, uh, this is the month of January. You can see that we've had 2.29 hundredths of an inch of rain. It's been slim pickings since October. Since October, the beginning of the water year into November, you can see this is a month, only 12 hundredths of an inch of rain. Finally, it started to pick up toward the end of December. So we are seeing these numbers come up. We're still a little bit about, about an inch or so below normal, but it's come up quite a bit than what we thought when we started the first part of January. So this is good news. We still have another four to five months left through the springtime of months that could be good moisture makers. So let's hope for the best there. Now something else, our temperature of 50 degrees is 10 degrees above the normal of 40.
The low of 36 is also 10 degrees above the normal of 40. So we've been looking at January as basically being well above normal with most of the temperatures. And this is the precipitation that we were talking about there. So if you look at the future cast, this is 5 o'clock. I just want to tell you that this evening looks good. I'm going to run it through tomorrow morning. There's still quite a few clouds around for your Saturday. And then Saturday night, here's the change at 8 o'clock. There's the storm system coming in. It's going to be breezy as it moves in. Starts out with a little rain or snow for early Sunday, and then you can see changing over to some snow. Right now it appears with a temperature of 40 degrees on Sunday. We're not looking for a, a much for accumulation on Sunday at this point. So Twin Falls has 56 with your temperature. As you move into some of the central mountains, you see highs into the lower 40s in some of those spots. Over here to the western mountains, temperatures are about 40 degrees for highs, which is doing pretty well for mountain locations. 49 for Nampa, 53 for Nampa. You see Boise tomorrow. Well, isn't that an amazing temperature? 54 and the same thing for Meridian. So in your seven day forecast, we're warming up for tomorrow. Sunday, there's the change in weather. Temperatures stay cool, but then after that, we're seeing most of these temperatures come up as we go more toward the end of the week. That's our weather. We've got more coming up. It is already the last day of January. We made it the new decade already a month old. Your new year resolutions probably already so last year, but hey, we're closer to spring by about a month, right? And it's Friday. Feel good Friday time for a little part of the week. We dedicate to hearing your good news and today we set up in downtown Boise. So my good news for today is I get to spend some quality time with some good friends that I haven't been able to in a while. We got we got to longboard after making a few plans and a few of those plans didn't work out. So now we're here. I, I love my job. I, I look forward to going to it every day. It's like the best part of the day. I have 12 children and a wonderful house in the mountains, but I still love Boise. My daughter, uh, she gets to go to prom. My daughter's 16. She 
uh, have special needs, but they uh, do a prom for kids with special needs. The and prom. Yes! Yeah, Night to Shine. Exactly. Um, and we just found out that her occupational therapist gets to be her buddy there, and so I get to drop her off, and uh, she's going to have an awesome night. Yeah, it's very good news. I'm having twins! A boy and a girl. One of each. One of each. Scared, nervous, excited. You know, hope they're healthy. Life's great. <laughs> I got hired at Dutch. And I'm so excited. And it's Friday. Yes. And I'm so happy. Happy Friday. We do Flower Friday. Every Friday we pass out flowers. It is Flower Friday and I just love making people's days. So like this is an amazing opportunity to just step in and if someone's having a bad day, you just give them a flower and hopefully brighten their day for a little bit. My other good news. So my mom in December, we thought she relapsed, but they misread all of her charts and she is still in remission. And it makes me really happy. Oh, you know, our other good news is Ooh. we have decided that we're going to do a triathlon. Iron Man. Half Iron Man. Both of you? Half yep. Iron Man. Half Iron Man, not Half full. Iron Man. Yeah. Still, though. <laughs> <laughs> my great news, it is my best friend's 22nd birthday. Today, right now, this very minute. Hopefully that's good news for today. And the smoothie is actually really good. So <laughs> have a great day, guys. Thank you for doing this. Half Iron Man, but still, that's awesome. Earlier this month, Disney chief Bob Iger said Baby Yoda was a Green Bay Packers fan. Unfortunately, Aaron Rodgers couldn't complete the comeback in the NFC Championship game, but even Packer fans are going to be watching the big game on Sunday, right? Well, maybe you're hosting and looking to put together the ultimate pop culture Super Bowl party. You may want to stop by the bakery at Albertson's Marketplace on Broadway and pick up a Baby Yoda Super Bowl cake. Look at this. Not sure who Baby Yoda is actually rooting for in this picture, but according to our breakdown in the newsroom, Baby Yoda is cared for by a bounty hunter. Bounty hunters work for gold. The Niners are named after the gold seekers who invaded California in 1849. Therefore, the child roots for the 49ers. We can all agree that, yep, Baby Yoda, cute enough to eat. And you can have it at home with you this Sunday. It's the quintessential red carpet question. What are you wearing? Or not wearing? And why does it matter? Oh, this again?
to wear or not to wear. I'm talking about a tie. And I promise this will be the last time we talk about it, maybe. The only days I wear a tie, I promise. It's not something I generally give a lot of thought to, though. We've addressed it a couple of times the last couple of days just because of the onslaught of comments, text messages, and emails we've received. We've tried to have fun with it, not taking either side too seriously. And I'm not trying to make this a thing, but I got an email last night in regards to my lack of a tie, and it got me thinking. Allison wrote to say, it's very hard to take you seriously or respect your newscast with the way you dress. She went on to talk about other stations in other cities and said, your casual approach makes us look like a bunch of hayseeds. I'll probably be changing channels. I'm sorry to hear that, Allison. But I'm also sorry that this seems to be the state of our society right now. The response to this tie thing, I got one right here, by the way, and I guess I can say it's kind of refreshing to see it's not just the women getting criticized in this business for what they wear, but it also feels like this tie thing is kind of a microcosm of the camps, factions, or the tribes we've separated ourselves into. Maybe it's because we have an R or a D by our name. Maybe it's because we belong to a different social class or live in another part of town. Or maybe because someone decides to not wear a piece of fabric tied in a knot around their neck. Instead of listening to the words a person has to say, what experiences or perspective they can share, we tend to discount them altogether based on our differences. Maybe the tie thing is a generational thing. Maybe not. Maybe that's too simplistic. I understand we all have an expectation of how something should be, and when it's not that way, we aren't comfortable with it. But maybe, just maybe, if we can get past a person wearing a tie or not, maybe we have hope that the other biases we wear around our necks can be taken off. And lastly, Allison repeated a famous quote, don't dress for the job you have, dress for the job you want. Thank you, Allison, for your email. I have the job I want. We'll be right back with some of your comments about today's show.
All right, we promised it. Now let's take a look at some of your comments that you sent in during the show, either before or after yesterday's show. We have a good question here sent in from Rebecca. Why did they put the cougar down? He was here first. He would have gone back home. Geez, don't kill beautiful wildlife. They will be gone one day. Then the humans will be sorry. And we have an explanation from the fish and game. We talked about this as it is with most wild animals. When they start making themselves more comfortable within city limits and such, well, the biggest factor, there were a lot of factors that went into this, but the biggest factor was they were afraid he was going to make himself comfortable by coming back down into the neighborhood, and then it would just create a danger for everybody who lives there. So that's kind of the biggest reason that they did what they did. I know it's sad to see the wild animals kind of taken away like that, but sometimes it becomes a nuisance and more than a nuisance in those situations. Do you know why Governor Little was in Parma for a good part of the day? That one from Dave. I believe it was capital for a day in Parma, so he was in town to hear what you had to say about what you think the state of Idaho should be doing right now. Feel Good Friday, the best thing, y'all. Thanks, Max. We love it, too. We love to hear what makes your day better, your week, your month. Always good news. Friday is the best way to, to end it. I think the 2-8 is a great idea, and I like seeing Brian and Jay without ties. We may change it up. Maybe tomorrow. Monday, I mean. Maybe we'll wear a tie. We'll see.